Hi, Josh here. Today I'm going to show off what might be one of the least flashy products in the MJBOT store, but which still fulfills an important role, the MJBOT's power disk board. In a typical legged robot, you might have many motors and controllers all attached to the same power bus. Each one of those controllers has a large DC link capacitance in order to adequately decouple the drive electronics during switching and load transients. Once you take all those DC link capacitors and stick them together, you have some serious capacitance. For example, the 12 QDD100s in a Quad A1 works out to nearly 2 millifarads of capacitance. At 24 volts, that's more than a joule of energy. When you first connect a low impedance source to this much capacitance, it acts as a dead short across the battery, resulting in a large current spike. That large current spike, when coupled through the inductance of your power wiring, can result in a large voltage spike that destroys your valuable electronics. I have a link in the description to prior blog entries describing this effect in more detail. The power disk board solves this problem by first applying a deliberately limited current to the output load for a period of time, and only after the load is charged up is the source connected via a low impedance pathway. While we're at it, the power disk board also breaks out multiple output connectors to simplify wiring and provides a power switch which can be monitored over a CAN and turned into a soft power switch. It can really be used in any robotics application where a soft power switch and pre-charging is useful. For example, on this mech warfare turret. With that introduction out of the way, let me show you how it works in the lab. Here we have the power disk board, the sample switch harness that is provided, an XT90 female connector soldered to a harness coming from a lab power supply, an FDCAN USB, a QDD100 servo, and an XT30 female to male cable. We'll start by connecting the illuminated switch with the sample harness. That plugs into the 4-pin JST PH connector and the output load, the QDD100, will connect this male XT30 there and the female to the servo. Now a CAN network needs a common ground connection and to avoid ground loops only one ground path between any two components is required. All of the MJBOTS CAN components have a ground pin on their connector. However, it is often inappropriate or incorrect to connect it if there is already a ground path between those components, say through the main power connection. With the power disk board, there is a further complication. The power switches it use switch the ground bus itself. That means the ground bus on the power disk board CAN connector should not be connected to the ground on a device that's load su supplied by it. The CAN controller on the power disk board has a common mode range beyond the full input range so the data lines can be connected with no problem. Here, the lab power supply I'm using is completely isolated in the same way a battery would be. Thus, we need to use the default FDCAN USB harness in order to have a common ground between the FDCAN USB and the power disk board. However, in a typical application where the CAN data from the power disk is connected as a load, you do not connect the ground. That said, Let's connect up the FDCAN USB. At this point, the supply is on. I'll make sure the power switch is off. And then we'll connect up the supply as if we were connecting a live battery. The supply is on. We'll plug it in as if we were connecting a live battery. At this point, we're ready to turn on the switch. The light will flash rapidly during the initial pre-charge sequence, then light continuously once it's ready. There we go. We can see the light full on, and we can see the power light on the QDD100. Now I'll switch over to the computer to demonstrate the CAN communication of the power disk board. I'll be using Minicom from the Linux terminal, but any terminal emulator on any operating system will work fine for this. To start, the power disk uses a 125 kilobit CAN connection, whereas FDCAN USB defaults to the 5 megabit that the QDD100 and the Modius controller use. 
To switch that, we'll enumerate the configuration, then change the bitrate and disable FDCAN frames. First, the bitrate. And then FDCAN frames. Now we can see CAN data streaming over from the power disk board. We can look at the reference manual for the board to see what the data means. It is available here in GitHub. So the CAN protocol. Byte 0 is the switch status, 0 being off and 1 is on. And byte 1 is the lock time, and it should be at CAN ID uh, 10004. So we look at this, we see it's receiving from 10004. The first byte is 1, and the second byte is 0. So the switch is on, and there's no lock. Let's turn off the switch and see that, yes, the byte does go to 0. You can turn it back on and observe that it goes to 1. The second byte is used for the soft power down feature and indicates the number of 100 millisecond intervals before a power off will take effect. We can set that using the 10005 CAN ID from the reference manual right here. The first byte is not meaningful and the second byte is the lock time in 0.1 second intervals. We'll just set it to the maximum value for the purposes of this test. Zero, zero, FF, we'll say. And now we can see the value counting down. If we turn off the switch, I can assure you the QDD100 is still powered despite the switch being off. When that countdown reaches zero, then the power output will be killed and the device will turn off. So you can use that feature from your load to uh, continually ping and say, stay on, stay on, stay on. And when you're ready to shut down, then you stop doing that and it will turn off. And yes, now that it reached zero, the output load is off. And that's it. Uh, once again, you can check the description down below for links, including to the MJBots Discord, where you can chat live to ask questions or discuss your application. Thanks.